Your Creative Push, Episode 5. The world doesn't care that you start, they care that you finish. Welcome to Your Creative Push. This is the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is Justin Gray. Justin has worked with top-tier comic book publishers, video game developers, as well as animation and film studios on a wide variety of properties. Think DC Comics and think Jonah Hex. When he's not helping serve the needs of the most recognizable entertainment companies on the planet, he also self-publishes novels and graphic novels. And Justin is currently part of the Paper Films team. And Justin, if I sound tired to you today, that's because last night I was... I swear to God, I was in bed, my wife was asleep, and I had a flashlight, and I was reading Abaddon, because it just came in the mail yesterday. <laughs> well, then you're allowed to be tired, that's fine. I appreciate yeah, it. it. was. Oh yeah, dude, it was it was very good, and uh, it, like I haven't done that since like I was little watching, or reading uh, like Uncanny X-Men or something like that, so it was, it was awesome, it was like bringing me back to my childhood. Well, that is one of the goals of doing anything creative, is to you bring joy to people's lives or remind them of a time that was less, uh, let's say less hectic. Right. Can you tell me a little bit more about Abaddon? Like the, uh, process of that? Um, well, it's a graphic novel adaptation of a screenplay. And, um, initially we love the story. Jimmy and I uh, worked on it together uh, along with, uh, Fabrizio Fiorentino. Jimmy Palmiotti. Yes. And, um, we wanted to essentially take the screenplay and and present it in a new light uh, because it, screenplay is different from a comic, comics different from a film, and there's a lot of different things that need to be uh, taken into account when you're when you're adapting anything. And uh, it seems like in the last couple of years, I've been doing uh, some big adaptation projects, and it's been a very interesting uh, process. It's a very it's a learning process. Uh, and initially you, what you want is having the experience of other people trying to adapt your material and then ending up with something that's almost unrecognizable, uh, with you know, with, within the context of what you created, I was very sensitive to, uh, maintaining the integrity of the property, um, sometimes to a fault, uh, which you have to also have some creative license to know that. You know, there are other ways, different mediums. You have to approach it a different way. You, know, you don't have this, the music and the, and the, the fast paced camera work of a live action um, form of entertainment. So you have to insinuate certain things and, and, and shortcut things through artwork. Uh, but that's one of the things I really like about it. And th- that particular story was one that sort of grabbed myself and Jimmy, and we were, we were thinking, well, you know, there's there's definitely a, a thing here that really plays to our sensibilities. And we just started working on it and, and doing minor tweaks to the plot and how it would be presented. And it's a mystery. So we wanted to make sure we could not telegraph uh, elements of that mystery and yet make it all work logically uh, by the time you reach the end of the story. Well, I have to say you're successful in that because I did not I did not see the I don't want to give anything away either. But uh, yeah, I didn't see it coming in. Who, who, <laughs> whose choice was it for the last page? Um was that was that always in the screenplay like how it ended the for the first issue um well we we it was it was a tough thing to do because uh that kind of ending is uncommon and a lot of times uh you know people can either get it and be fine with it or be you know or be put off by it in this particular case it seemed to make sense for the story right and it was just always part of it you know, it's, it's a very organic process when you work on something like this because there's a lot of people involved and there's people involved that, that are behind the scenes. And in this particular case, there was, it was a Kickstarter. So we had the great support of a fan base and people that were really interested in seeing this project come to life. Um, so that's, that's, that's all part of your consideration in terms of responsibility to make, you know, it's responsibility to the screenwriter, it's responsibility to our partners and things like that. I know that sounds very, it doesn't sound organic, but it really is because there's so many people involved. You have to be able to have a clear vision and be able to drive that all the way to the end of the project and then walk away and say, okay, we did, we did the job. It's there and we're you know proud of the work. Sure. Sure. And uh, yeah, I was, 
I wouldn't I wasn't put off by it, but mm. I went I definitely had some emotions going to bed finally <laughs> when I finally turned the flashlight off last night. Did you want to like, turn hey. the flashlight off? It's a real question, but No, I didn't. I I wanted I need to get the next issue. Mm. Well it's actually that's a self contained um graphic novel and that's why the nature of the ending Oh, there's not a second issue? No. No, that's uh, oh. that is the self contained graphic novel based. All right, well that, now I really have feelings about it <laughs> no but that's it's great and uh well i don't want to i don't want to say anything because i don't want to give it away but uh right. yeah you can uh, I'll, I'll put a link to if you want to get abaddon which i highly recommend uh i'll put the, a link in the show notes page at uh, your creative com slash justin gray sounds great so you worked with jimmy on this and i, I just wanted to ask you not necessarily um working with him but what's what's it like working with another person like like as far as like creatively like when you butt heads on stuff or maybe when they want to go a certain direction and you don't want to um what like what's that like you know it, it, any kind of media like this like comics and, and you know, film and, and music you you're very rarely you're the only person doing something you know noveling not writing novels is probably the the, the most common form of being an individual creating individually um so you have to you have to understand what's best for the the story. Uh, you know, where 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 is you going to start at the beginning? You're going to go to the middle. You're going to get to the end. But what's the best three stages of that? And sometimes that means surrendering your idea to someone else's. Sometimes that means forcing your idea. You know, in a sense of saying, you know, here's my idea, and here's why I think it works, and I dare you to refute why it works. And if you refute why it works, then you know, okay, your argument is stronger and, and that's the way to go. Uh, a lot of times the project can dictate a lot of that. If it's, if it's two people sitting in a room creating their own character and there's differences, I could see sometimes that, that definitely causes friction. I, I, you know, I, that hasn't happened with me yet. I've definitely asked for more or conceded more at times than I maybe wanted to. But in the end, I always say, okay, if it's if it's a peer to peer level and not a, a corporate level to a, where it comes from, depending on how the person I'm working with views the property, you know, if they really understand it, then you usually don't have a lot of those discrepancies. They're usually minor. They're usually what's the best way to present a scene to convey this part of the story. And your idea may be OK and the other person's idea might be great, but the ability to recognize which is which and not be grappling onto your mediocre idea thinking it's brilliant it's a hard thing to do but i've had so much practice in working with other people that it's it's rare where i i get so adamantly attached to something that i'm willing to come to blows over it right well that's good i i hope that you've never came to blows with anybody for over or i mean you can get frustrated like anything else and in any line of work if you're partnering up with people and they don't always see eye to eye but i you know i've worked in other industries and, and and in those other industries yeah i've wanted to sort of punch someone in the face but sure or just draw like a comic of you beating the crap out of them like from abaddon <laughs> yeah well you know, there's some good fight scenes in there man yeah he, the, the artwork is fantastic yeah uh, fabrizio is just he's, he's mind blowing and I, it's funny you mentioned that because that's kind of a that's kind of a thing that happens early on when when people write and it's not just me i mean i'm guilty of it i've seen it in other people as well. So I feel that I can say something because I, I have done it. I have written stories of being mad at editors when I was 18 or 19 and being furious with Zetter and like, I'm going to kill this guy in a gruesome way in a story because he thinks I'm terrible and not realizing <laughs> that that's just a complete waste of your own time. Like right. he doesn't care. You know, the editor's like, I'm already done with you. You get rejection letters. And the sooner you learn to deal with the fact that you're not going to encounter instant success and everyone is not going to like you. And, everyone's not going to like your work and you have to have thick skin, especially if you want to use things like the internet or social media. Um, you can't, you can't really allow those things to take over your thought process or your creative process. Yeah. And, and speaking of, you said about when you were 18, can you go back even further maybe and tell us, uh, one of your first creative moments? Well, it came about, I, I always loved comics and especially comics were very much, a part of my life because I was I was um, a very solitary kid. Um, I didn't have the greatest upbringing, and so I I sort of relied on 
these fictional characters uh, to fill a gap in my in my um, social development, which is probably a horrible thing to do, especially if you like Batman. Um, <laughs> but it, it filled a need uh, as a child, an emotional context and a sense of belonging because you could always find a way to belong to a certain team or group or mindset. I mean, uh, the obvious one is always the X-Men because it covers such a broad array of people and mm-hmm. personalities and nationalities and preferences, and which is one of the great things about these these characters before you know before they became aged in in certain ways there was there was a maturity but it wasn't maturity for the sake of maturity you you know if you were if you were eight nine and you were reading stuff that was above your level uh, emotionally and your context and your relationships it didn't talk down to you you know and and it wasn't something that just sort of had to get your attention because the playing field there wasn't enough you know, food to feed the playing field. Sure. Um, but for me, when I, I really wanted to draw and I really loved art, but I, over a period of into high school or whatever, I realized I just didn't, I didn't have the skill no matter how much I was doing. I, I had I plateaued at a certain point and it, what came out of my hand never even came close to what was in my head. So I had to change my strategy in terms of I had to get this stuff out. I, I, if I don't write, I go crazy. So I realized that creative writing was the way to go. And once you decided that creative writing was the way to go, like what did, what happened then? Well, I, uh, naturally as, uh, I was writing really bad poetry at first. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I was listening to me. You know, I mean, I love music and you know, we all grew up, uh, li- we all grew up listening to music and I thought I could write songs. You know, it's easy. Everything's easy when you don't know anything. Sure. Um, so I wrote a lot of bad poetry. I think I even wrote Conan poetry, which is probably, I, I, I showed it to my English teacher. He was like, you need to focus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what I, what I really would like is for at that point in my age for, for people to say, you know, I'm not trying to crush your dreams, but refocus your dreams because <laughs> there is no market for Conan poetry. So that's <laughs> like such a nice save way to six it. months of writing. Even though you learn from everything, but right. um, you know, not saying you have to write jingles for Toyota or anything, but this is true. Um, yeah, so I I started out doing that, and I, you know, I'm pretty stereotypical in the sense of like you you're influenced by everything, and you go through phases of everything, and you you go through phases of where this particular writer's style, technique, lifestyle, all that stuff becomes like the, the mystique around them. You're like, oh, I love that mystique, you know, because everyone. In one way or another, everyone likes to create some kind of mystique about themselves. And then if you're creating something, you get a little carried away with it, I think, at times. Some people do and some people don't. Thank God the Internet came along and everyone can just pretend to be anything they want to be. Sure. But I realized that I was I had things to say, but I wasn't sure how to say them. And, you know, you have to some of the things I wanted to talk about. I just wasn't mature enough to fully understand all the sides of them to make fully realized and fleshed out characters. Uh, I was borrowing a lot from this and that and other writers. And it took, it took a while for me to say, am I serious about this? And what direction do I want to go in? And so the poetry thing kind of fell to the wayside, but I actually did get two or three pieces of poetry published in, in zines uh, that people were putting together in their spare time that were in other parts of the country. So it wasn't just, you know, me and me and a copy machine and a staple stapler and, you know, handing it out to relatives and them rolling their eyes like, oh, God, I gotta read <laughs> Here we go. Again. Yeah, oh, when's he going to get out of this phase? Um, yeah. So then I started working on stories and I started thinking about things. But I always I always kept coming back to comics, uh, even after I, I'd leave for a while and then come back. And, and uh, I still wanted to pursue that uh, creatively as part of it, not as the only thing I wanted to do, not even close to the only thing I wanted to do, but I de- it was definitely something I wanted to conquer in a way. No, you know, just in some small way, just to be able to say, I got into comics, I created comics and some of them were good. You know, that's. Yeah. So would you say like, uh, like comics is like that thing that's like always been like kind of in your mind, your whole life, basically like a, like a lifelong goal. It was, it was, uh, you know, well, it was my intro to reading, mm-hmm. reading for joy, reading for pleasure. And, you know, uh, expanding my vocabulary uh, in a lot of ways, which is interesting because, you know, you, you wouldn't, you know, classically people would say, you know, why are you reading that garbage? And, you know, that's simply because they didn't read it. You know, I'm sure people who read uh, one type of genre only and other people sell them that's garbage because they don't like it or they don't understand it or they don't have an interest in it, but it doesn't automatically have to be garbage, which is one of the things that makes me. 
comics, I always felt a connection to them for a lot of different reasons. And as time passed, you know, my, my ideas and my interests and my goals change and shift as they do with anything else. But the idea of, of creating comics, they're such a wonderful medium. And, and right now they're kind of, it feels like they're in a strange place right now. And I'm wondering how that's going to shake out, you know, just with the larger media interest groups and the way that Marvel and DC have now sort of been corporatized in a new way uh, for those companies that didn't exist when I was a kid or, you know, or, you know, or even 15 years ago. So it's interesting to see how that shakes out and as opposed to it being a vehicle for something else and how pure the genre is. You know, I mean, there's still people doing that on their own, uh, but it's, with those, those used to be the, the cash machines that would drive the industry. Um, so you had room and appreciation for uh, different kinds of stories. You know, I'm not really sure how that's going to shake out. Now. It is interesting to see how with, with the movies, like, just taking you know just mm-hmm. going crazy how like and just almost being an automatic success how people kind of view comics as like what's going to be the next movie you know as opposed to what's going to be the next long running comic that i want to read yeah it really it, there is that sense and you the general audience i don't think i could be wrong but the general audience doesn't realize that what they're watching is is 30 40 years old yeah i don't, I don't think they do realize you know, these are not fresh comics that are coming out, uh, you know, every Wednesday. These are decades old storylines and they're brilliant. And there's a reason why they still translate and still resonate with people. Um, but there isn't that sort of groundswell of, you know, that's that's grandpa's comics. You know what I mean? Like there isn't that sense of and you can't really have. And I mean that from the audience perspective, like the audience right. saying, OK, well, yeah, where's but where's ours? You know, because you get that with music. Like, I always say the analogy of, of you know, comics should give certain people a headache. If you're of a certain age group or demographic, um, you like what you like, that's fine. But if you're younger, if you're 16, 17 years old, I just wonder where that group is. You know, where the group that says, yeah, yeah, that's that's too slow or not noisy enough. And, you know... And you listen to stuff that makes, you know, the parents go, oh, my God, what's that noise? Turn it down. What is that? Is that what the hell is Skrillex? I don't It just sounds like this. You know, and I don't yeah. see that a lot. I mean, some people are doing that, but it's not as it's not as strong a movement. Well, that's the great thing is that I feel like no matter what you create as a creative person, like there's always going to be someone that it resonates with. Like if, it, if if it's something that you truly love, there's guaranteed to be like, a lot of people out there that it resonates with as well because there's just so many people on the planet. That's true. That's true. And reaching them has never been easier and harder at the same time. Yes, yeah, true. <laughs> because, it, because everybody's out there trying to reach their people. That's what makes it hard. It's tough. Yeah, and you look at small... If you look at the way, that just for Amazon purposes, the, the vast amount of people that sat down and wrote books and self-published them in the last five to ten years, it's staggering. And there's no way to really know because now the slush pile exists for the consumer as opposed to being predicated on the tastes of X amount of editors, which is both wonderful and and horrible at the same time, because a lot of times people need that people need that editor. Um, But also you, it took a lot longer for some people to get brilliant pieces of art made or brilliant movies made or books published because of that one thing of um, a broad array of material being subjected to a narrow view of, of tastes right um or you know i mean it's the pastor pasteurization process but a lot of times things get missed so it's it's an interesting trade-off to me i just like to see it happen with comics more like a bigger broader array but it's hard to make comics because they cost a lot of money especially for people who can't write and draw them by themselves what would you suggest to somebody who who did want to make a comic that doesn't have that kind of support or team it's just like one individual sitting here listening to us right now mm-hmm. what would you suggest to him or her well uh you can still do it you know it's going how happy you're going to be with it is up to you uh understanding you know your strengths and weaknesses that's that's up to you but there's nothing stopping people from doing it um but there's definitely a, there's definitely a, a disparity of success to creation and if you're doing it 
for the pure love of doing it, like I have to do this thing and maybe the only thing I do, or it may be the thing that I want to do, but I realize that it's, it's never going to change the broader direction of my life, you know, because we live in a culture and I'm, I'm there's a soapbox around here somewhere. <laughs> we have a culture that is telling people almost constantly at the, at the point in their day where their brain just wants to switch off and just like put their work behind them and forget about the horrible thing they saw on the news or whatever's happening in their personal life. And they just want to be entertained and taken away. And a portion of that, that's been very, very successful in getting into people's lives is the idea that everyone is like a handshake away from being a rock star, a handshake away from being incredibly wealthy, incredibly happy, famous for just for being that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that, that the idea too, is that you, you have to be happy with yourself. You have to understand what it is because the percentage of just people who think that their nine-year-old is going to be in the Olympics is, you know, guarantee that the, the kids that actually make it is a much smaller group than the parents who think that their kid is the one. But if you're doing it for the pure joy of doing it, then everything else is sort of comes along with it. A lot of times you'll, you'll, you'll see interviews with people and they'll say, I didn't really expect anybody to care. And, and we've seen uh, celebrities who can't handle that, whose lives go horribly out of control because they didn't really even think about it. It's not what's important to them. Um, you know, if there are certain people who are incredibly wealthy who don't care about money, it's the idea of acquiring it or it's the work behind it or whatever it is. Um, so at the base of it, you, if you're not if you're not overjoyed or happy, if it doesn't enrich your life personally, then there's no there's no reason to do something. So if you're getting that feeling from creating a comic or writing a story or painting a picture for yourself, then that's the best attitude to have. If you're in it, if you're saying, OK, this comic is going to go blow every i'm i'm the next robert kirkman i'm the i'm the next mark miller you're gonna you're in for a rough road even if you are there's gonna be a period of time where it's not it's not gonna just come to you if that makes sense makes a lot of sense and yeah there's something to be said about you know setting expectations or just having these grandiose um, ideas in your head um and that's something that i try to promote is don't think about any of the after stuff just think about the doing of it and if the doing like the doing the thing isn't fun or enjoyable as you said then really there's no point because the, the level you're trying to get to like you're going to be spending your whole life doing something shitty that you hate like mm -hmm. or that you eventually will hate so if there's if it doesn't come from a place of joy or, or love or, or happiness then there's really absolutely no point to do it anyway and I realize how like folky and new agey that sounds, but it's just no. I don't think it does at all. It's true. I mean, yeah. if, if you walk, out, I mean, there's no feeling like that place you're in where time becomes irrelevant and you're so engrossed in what you're doing, no matter what it is. And then when you walk away, and it, there, there's an actual thing there left behind. I think that that's great. I mean, that's that goes for anything, whether you're building houses. I don't think you should build houses unless you really care about building a home for someone. You know, I understand that there can be huge amounts of money in it, but I think it's really, it's something that is important to, like, it's something you should take pride in. It's an opportunity to take pride in your life's work or whatever it is that you're doing, which I think is, is an important thing to me. And I, I don't think, I think that was kind of beaten to my head. If you want to make a comic, you can make a comic and, and you can publish it. You can self-publish it through Comixology, uh, which gives you a huge platform. But again, you're in a room you know, you might as well be standing on a convention floor in San Diego or New York screaming, this is the best comic ever. Someone pick it up. You know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? Like that's how drowned out you can be. Um, and a lot of times, like I said, like we were just talking about, if you're not in it for the joy or the love of being in it, that's where you see people get angry. There's that sort of, you just can't see how talented I am. And, and it, even if you watch ever uh, um, any kind of audition show, there's always emphasis paid to people who are just like they just can't see how brilliant i am because they suck right right right. you know and it's like yeah maybe they're not i maybe i don't think they're the most talented people but you still have to make it's still a broad enough spectrum that the guy who's working the camera or the boom is like yeah you can't sing i'm sorry yeah. you know <laughs> it's like not like going up to you oh you got a raw deal from somebody right and yeah singing might be a little bit different than doing comics or art like i, I feel like sometimes 
so you know there's for singers you can just tell there's no hope <laughs> but that, i mean that, that that's also no reason to not sing if you like if you love singing <laughs> exactly. but like we said if it brings joy to you um then you should do it but i think you have to understand and, and nobody really wants to understand that out of themselves the number one thing is hard work you know you can have an inclination and a talent for something but the most of that can only be curated with with work with with trial and error and repetition and, and a desire to get better and to learn more. So that that's that's always an asset for his talent. You can have the same people. You can have ten people with the same level of talent and ten different work ethics. But the one with the best work eth- work ethic is going to be the one that's the most successful. Unless, of course, you run into those weird anomalies where people just get fixated on something or someone, and then that person is elevated. You know, and then every, then you sort of have apologists trying to fill in the gaps on that. But. Right, right. Yeah, it's all about time. And like you said, that's the thing that people don't want to come to grips with sometimes because nobody has enough of it. But, you know, just putting a little bit of time every day, if you don't put any time, is, is better than, than nothing. And eventually you will, you know, polish your skills and, and, and get there. It was an interesting uh, thing just in that context. Like my... My daughter's uh, just starting to learn composition and writing, and she likes to write. She likes to tell stories, and she was uh, the the assignment was about I don't know, a couple weeks long, which she had to keep writing the same story over and over again. She had to do rewrites, and she was like, "What are you talking about? I do rewrites. It's done. I did it. Look, there it is." And I would say, "Well, it can be better," and she would say, "Why?" <laughs> there was the difference between she doesn't understand. She doesn't. The interest in her thing is it's not my story to tell. It's an assignment and it's done. So why should I make it work better? And and I think that translates if you if you're not presented with that at a young age and saying, well, here's why it is. It's not just meant to drive you crazy. It's not clerical work. They're actually trying to teach you to understand story, to use language better, to be more concise in what you're saying to someone. And you know, obviously, you know, can't really go that far into it with an eight year old, but it's an interesting, but there are teenagers and older where I've run into people and they're like, Oh, what do you mean? This person has to change by the end of the story, but they're the hero. And I'm like, yeah, okay. But nobody wants to stay static, you know? And sometimes it's, it's, they don't understand that it's to improve the story. They think it's just to continue to work on the same thing. And Mm -hmm. there's a big difference. And I get it. You know, you think what you've done and a lot of, one of the mistakes that, that I've made that I'm sure other people have made is not, it's not all there. It's not, it's, there's still chunks of it in your head. And so when someone comes in and reads it and they go, I don't get it. And you go, Oh, I just don't understand me. I got to go drink, you know, half a gallon of whiskey. You know, no, it's just that you have to understand that there's still chunks of it in your head. And if you go in and you look at it again, you'll realize, Oh, I, I forgot to say this. And I forgot to say that. So this part over here doesn't make sense to anyone who's not inside my head. Yeah, there is a certain skill to that, isn't there? Like, um, to be able to translate the things that are in your head. Because, you know, you, like, I can write something, write a story, and then my, I'll, I'll give it to my wife, and she'll be like, oh, I don't really get this. And I, I have that same reaction where I'm like, well, why don't you see it like I see it? But mm-hmm. that, that's the problem, because every time you reread it, you're seeing it as you originally saw it, not necessarily as a, a fresh reader. It's almost like you need to have, like, a reset button on your brain and, be, and come to it with a, a fresh slate yeah you you literally fill in the gaps and the reader is like i'm not you know i'm not here to fill in gaps i'm here to have the whole thing filled in for me um i, I had an editor say to me once uh I, I, there was dialogue for this character and i was in love with the dialogue because it was very it was almost you know an exact copy of actual people talking mm-hmm. and he said well he's like this doesn't work and i said no what do you mean it doesn't work it works it happened and he, and he said, but it's not very interesting the way it is. It has to be more interesting than it just happened because then it means it doesn't have the same impact that it does to you because you were there, you were experiencing it. You knew the parties involved. You saw the emotions on their faces and you had a personal relationship one way or another with the people that were having the conversation. So for you, you fed into that with, with a, a, a wealth of knowledge that the reader doesn't have. So you have to be able to take that and put it into the language and say, this is how I felt when I heard this and make the reader feel that because it's real ultimate at the end of the day, trying to make people feel something as well. You're not just trying to 
Well, it's not cotton candy, it's steak. You know, I want them to feel like, unless they're vegan, sorry. And I, I don't know what the vegan equivalent of steak is, but I have friends that will tell me when they hear this. I'm sure there's some something that vegans can sink their teeth into as well. Yes, and I shouldn't pick on my vegan friends. <laughs> That's okay. They deserve it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll edit that out. You gotta have a sense of humor too. You don't have a sense of humor if you're a sort of a humorless. That's the worst kind of writer, like the humorless, curmudgeonly writer. Oh, uh, it's so it's like swimming <laughs> in a pool of like oil. <laughs> it's like you have any idea who you're talking to right now? Who are you? I'm angry at you now for being here and talking to me. That's that's a good villain voice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, who is your greatest inspiration? Right now, my daughter, but. That's just, that's sort of, oh, it's almost a cliche to say, but I, I, it's interesting because I get questions like, what's your favorite all the time? Sure. And I'm like, I don't have a favorite, you know, and for an eight year old, that's impossible. You have to have a favorite. I mean, otherwise, what are you doing with your life? But yeah, you can't have two favorite colors. Yeah. That's, that's in conflict. Uh, but I realized I never, I, I've gone through phases where I've been completely obsessed with material and things like that, or, or someone's output and content, or just read every book I could by a certain writer or uh, artist, or, you know, seen every movie by someone. Um, and, you know, at that point, you're really just consuming a lot of times, but you're learning from it too, uh, mm-hmm. which I think is absolutely important. So I think learning, I think for me, the idea of channeling just into a single thing is kind of maddening. I mean, the closest I can get to that is like pizza. I think I could eat pizza. <laughs> that's my favorite food. But like, I don't have a favorite band. I don't have a favorite movie. I don't have, because there's so many different aspects of life to me that, that I might, you know, I, I'm in the mood for this today. You know, I'm in, I'm in the mood for a, a romantic comedy, which is not very often unless they're well-written, but I, I can't say, you know, this is my favorite director because of this, because there's so many talented people in the world over such a period of time. We have, we have the luxury of having uh, more than any time in human history of a, a library of every kind of material open to us um, that it's really hard to just say, you know, if you grew up in a small town, you never left a small town. You saw it's a wonderful life in the theater as your first movie or star Wars. And that was the only movie you really saw and you didn't leave. Town. Yeah. I, I think, I think, so for some people that that's that's a, a reasonable thing but for me it's not I, I i i watch stuff and i listen to stuff that i feel very isolated on and i think that like the, the group of us that are doing this right now is probably so small that i don't even have the energy to go look for them you know what i mean it's like making my daughter watch bollywood movies she's like what are we watching and i'm like Shh, you're gonna love it in about 20 minutes and then three hours from now you're gonna be like ready for bed um there's been so many influences and then the ability to to look at, at those influences and and say and see them as a certain time period in your life. You're like, oh, I remember when I was into that. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it, it just becomes part of who you are. But it also, I, I think it's great to learn from those points in time and find new ones. It's really important to find new ones because once you stop exploring, I think you you sort of become stagnant on, on a bunch of different levels if you're not constantly looking for something interesting and new and different and i know for you know for a certain segment of people that that's not of any interest whatsoever but for me i always i always hope to stumble across something something that's new and sometimes it's just new to me and there's a group of people like oh where have you been for the last two years you know like right, right. But, i mean that's that's gonna happen like, you're the posers are here now you know, <laughs> yeah but, uh, yeah bandwagon i yeah. uh, uh I, f- I found that that your answer is pretty common amongst the people I've interviewed so far uh this this idea of kind of going through phases and just like kind of consuming somebody or like <laughs> consuming somebody <laughs> you weren't but, going to talk about my <laughs> for flesh it's a good idea for a new comic there you go. but uh no just consuming somebody's work or music or, or you know whatever it may be and kind of just like moving on like in phases and i think that's important because like you said you, you will become stagnant if you, if you just listen to the same stuff over and over again I think it's painful to be shopping in a supermarket and hearing stuff that you were listening to in college and doing things that you're not doing anymore you know it's kind of it's like oh my god you've pasteurized my youth and now it's playing in kmart you know like <laughs> I'm like, wait a second, you know, this, but it happens to everyone. And, you know, at some point, someone's going to be pushing a cart down a supermarket and Justin Bieber is going to be blasting out on speakers. 
And they're going to go, oh, my God, it's Bieber. I hated that kid. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like, it was a song when I was 12. And, you know. Yeah. It's just there is no, there is nothing is sacred yeah, in, in a capitalist country because yeah. there's always some money to be made somewhere. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> Not exactly comic driven conversation though sorry oh no 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 it's completely okay it's not about one specific thing it's just about like the mentality and uh that being said um i want to ask you to do our what's called our final push okay and that's where i ask you to reach through the microphone and grab the shoulder of somebody that you've already inspired today and kind of give them that final push into doing doing something creative i i just believe that if you really want to do something that you should do it that that creatively, no, there's some things that you want to do that you shouldn't do. But <laughs> if you really want to create something, if you if this is a passion that you have, um, if you really want to do it, then you should do it. Because I have met a lot of people uh, in strange places who say, oh, I'm writing a book. Or I, I, I started a book. Or I started a comic. Or I started uh, to write this novel. And, you know, the world doesn't care that you started. They care that you finished. Uh, when it comes to art, they want to see, they want to know and feel the thing that you're talking about, that if you have an interest in it, because almost everyone has started a novel at some point, whether it was a sentence or 400 pages, um, because it, everyone's life story is worth telling, but not everyone can tell their life story. But if you're the person that can do that, even if you feel above anything else, don't worry about what other people say. Don't worry about what you know, your insecurities and because no one's going to see it unless you show it to them. So you just, just create it, write it, paint it, draw it. And then when it's done, walk away for a little bit and come back to it and then see, see how you feel about it, see what's there. And, you know, there's, there's a learning process to that. And, and maybe it's, you know, some people have one book in them and that's, you know, for people that want to write 500 books, that's an agonizing reality, but they wrote the book and they, created the short movie they wrote a song they sang a song in front they they if you want to do it you have to do it and you'll find that out rather quickly you'll find that out uh regardless of you of the money situation or the time situation because we tend to find a way to do the things when we genuinely want to do them and you you may start out wanting to do something you may say i'm going to write a novel and you might end up doing something completely different that gives you the same feeling you were looking for or gives you the same sense of purpose and worth and enjoyment so you should always be open to the fact that you start out one way and you end up in a place you didn't expect but if you're happy there there's nothing wrong with that ever the important thing is to start doing it and the second part is to finish something yes that you finished it because if you leave it unfinished it doesn't really it's sort of it's it's a kind of giving up that if that, that you'll never know You'll never know what the end result is. You may think you know the end result and walk away because of that, but we're not always the best judge of what we create or what we do or what we look like. I mean, I can't, you know, one person might tell someone they're beautiful and they go, oh, I got a pimple on my face and I'm ugly and I hate my hair. And that doesn't really matter to them. Right. That's your thing. But once you become comfortable with the fact that there's always someone that's interested in in you, whether it's you as a person, whether it's you that you're creating something, it may be one person, it may be a hundred million people, but unless you finish what you start, you'll never know. You'll just always be one of those things. Finish what you start. Perfect words. And on that note, let's finish this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Justin, you can find Justin on his website or his team's website, I should say, paperfilms.com. Highly suggest you check that out. And also you can follow him on Twitter, which is at JV Gray. And uh, you can also check out the show notes page on yourcreativepush.com slash Justin Gray. All the resources will be there, as well as a link to buy Abaddon and all his other work. And I highly recommend you do. I have Abaddon sitting in front of me. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. Justin, thank you so much for coming on the show today, and thanks for giving us that push today. Sure, my pleasure. Boom, great conversation with Justin. Remember, finish what you start. Nobody cares. Like Justin said, nobody cares what you start. Everybody says they're going to start something. Some people do. Not everybody finishes something, so be that person that finishes something. Hopefully, this interview gave you the push that you needed to get started today, so just make sure you finish. 
tomorrow's show, we have a special episode. It's actually a written episode because I have Viora, which is a duo that it produces awesome, awesome music. They're on the show, but they are anonymous. So instead of not having them on the podcast, I decided to have a written episode. So it'll be just a quick episode where I uh, encourage you to hit up the show notes page to read that interview. It's a great one. So yeah, I will see you tomorrow. I uh, really appreciate all the support that you've given me this week. Uh, Thank you so much for all the ratings and reviews on iTunes. That's huge help to us. Uh, And if you give us a rating and review, I will say your name on the air. And thank you for your review. Also, thank you so much for listening, for subscribing, and most importantly, for for just doing your work and getting your stuff done, because that's the entire purpose of this podcast. So have a great weekend, and I will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.